इवनिंग गुड इवनिंग एवरी वन गुड इवनिंग सदगुरु प्रणाम सो लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन वेलकम टू पार्ट टू ऑफ साधु और शैतान वी डिड द पार्ट वन टू इयर्स बैक एंड आई आस प्रदीप गुआ द गाय बिहाइंड द एडवर्टाइजिंग फंक्शन I said, "You want me to speak to Sadhguru? Why do you want to call this session Sadhu or Shaitan?" But uh, I think, uh, like Godfather One, Godfather Two, we must have done quite well that I've been invited again. Um, I am very privileged that, despite the kind of lifestyle I lead, I always get an opportunity to spend one evening, a little bit of time with Sadhguru. Maybe um, the prayer that he said was for me. Uh-huh. Anyway, this is not a confession. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, my role today is to get him to share things with you, and I and my role is the same as yours as an audience. I would love to hear a lot about what he has to say, and um, I'll, I'll try and um, ask questions which are relevant to life. and have some relevance to your lives as retail professionals out here and some of you are fantastic your stories have been absolutely amazing today so let me start off sadguru by asking you that uh, you probably are the biggest multitasker that i have met in my life you are into sharing wonderful things with people millions of people and you find the time to, to play golf and you ride a motorcycle like a champion you are on a helicopter um you do a lot of um, stuff in ecosystems with your green hands i don't know what all you do how do you manage your time that last Because thing was not a good thing <laughs> <laughs> i don't know what all you do <laughs> no that that is a sense of amazement <laughs> and there are people who are very busy people and so we believe we are very busy people we would like to know as to how you manage your time and what is the kind of advice you would like to give us so that life beyond work is a lot more meaningful at least a little more meaningful than what we lead a little closer to the kind of meaningful life that you lead uh, from what i observe uh from people as i travel more and more meet various kinds of people in business academics science and regular people all over the world what i see is uh, most people in the 24 hours that we have per day they are more preoccupied than busy that is their own thoughts and their own emotions are such a big issue that most of their time is spent dealing with that they may be working but in their work a lot of struggles are within themselves if you are in any kind of sport or any creativity you would know that uh, a little struggle means your ball will go somewhere else your ragam thalam will go somewhere else your painting will go somewhere else nothing will happen properly or in other words what could happen very simply unfortunately happens with lots of difficulty this is mainly because they have been given a phenomenal gadget or a phenomenal machine which is the human mechanism <coughs> above all a phenomenal dimension called the mind they are trying to operate this phenomenal machine or a gadget or a computer if you would like to call it without reading the user's manual every day struggling with their own stuff and it doesn't get solved before they are 20 or something 
till the last day on their deathbed, they're still struggling with the same things, their thoughts and their emotions. If they learn to sort this out very early in their life, I'm sure they can work half the number of hours that they're working and be a lot more productive than the way they are right now. My effort is to bring this possibility to people's lives that you can li live life with ease, not with struggle. One thing is when we say work, it's uh, many young people, wonderful people who are getting recognized for whatever wonderful things they have done, leaving them apart but generally work means always been people have been taught that they must work hard. Nobody told them they must work joyfully. Nobody told them their work should be an expression of their joy or their love. They have to work hard. If you work hard, life will be tedious. How else, how else will it be? You will do something hard only because you don't know how to do it. If you know how to do it, you would do it with ease. So without learning how to do something, if we try to do it, without investing enough time in perception, if life is all expression, then life becomes a big struggle. Most people are not doing anything except earning a living, maybe reproducing and dying one day, <laughs> nothing more. <laughs> they may believe they're doing many things, but this is all they're doing. Eating, sleeping, reproducing, dying one day. That is such a big fuss. Every other creature is able to do this from an earthworm to an insect to anything and anything. Everybody is doing this, they all earn their own living, they eat, they sleep, they reproduce and they die. With one millionth of our brain, they're able to do it. With this big brain, human beings are struggling not with the things that they're doing, they're struggling with the brain itself. Their own intelligence has become a serious problem. What is the biggest boon in our life? What is the greatest benefaction in our life, which is our intelligence? This has become a problem because they don't know how to hold it, they don't know how to use it, constantly it works against themselves. When I say it works against you, people may call all kinds of names, may use all kinds of words to describe this. They may call it stress, they may call it tension, they may call it misery, they may call it depression, they may call it anxiety, they may call it madness. Essentially, it's your intelligence turned against you. Your intelligence is not working for you, it's working against you. So my fundamental work is this, that at least your body and your mind should work for you. Nobody else may work for you, it doesn't matter. <laughs> At least your body and in your intelligence must work for you. If this one thing happens, you living blissfully, gracefully, effectively is a natural consequence. Yeah. One of the other things um, which, which I found uh, <clears throat> very important to us as a society, as a country which came up uh, when Nagesh was speaking earlier just before you came in, that in our society, there is a bias towards skill, against skill. We, we try and believe that a, being a babu in a railway station <laughs> is probably a better job than being a retail employee. And, uh, and Nagesh said that some of the people think that uh, the moment a girl's father gets to know, that the prospective boy works in a shop, he says, so, humko to ladki nahi milti hai. Um, there is a bias against skill. Because uh, usually the father believes he's supposed to catch a customer <laughs> <laughs> So, um, in and… Re retail business means you have maximum contact with customers. So you are supposed to find your bride, you shouldn't bother your father. <laughs> yeah, they find a lot of… they, they, they always find… These people find the girls, but the girl's <laughs> father doesn't want to give the girl to them, that's the problem. Um, I think that's a huge need of the country at this point of time and I'm 
uh, heard that the principal secretary of skills of Maharashtra is here, people are here. I think there are two things that come to my mind. One is the way society looks at skills um, in a bit derogatory fashion. And two is the self-respect of a skilled worker. I, I personally believe that if you are confident about yourself, the world will change itself. I would like you to comment on this because it's very relevant to some very hard-working people here that they get the respect in society and they learn to self-respect themselves in the years ahead of us. The world uh, respecting you is the quality of the world around you. If they are that kind, they will respect you. <laughs> but uh, I know a lot has been said about this, but you respecting yourself, I think is a little crazy. Respect is between two people, but I'm asking anybody here, isn't respect between two people that uh, you respect somebody for who they are? I respect myself, you must be mad. Because uh, th these things, like uh, this is a big thing, you know, in America people are saying, all these days they used to say, I believe in God. Now they say, I believe in myself <laughs> All these days they used to say, I love you to somebody. These days they have started and I love myself. See, to love, to believe, to respect, you need two. If you have become two within yourself, for sure you are heading for madness. Because an individual means you are not further divisible. If you become two within yourself, then uh, you are working towards madness. You are working hard and you may succeed. <laughs> yeah. If you really become two, then we say you're schizophrenic, isn't it? So, this has been worked in so many different ways by religious people, by new age philosophers, all kinds. I love myself, I respect myself, I believe in myself, uh, me and my ego, me and my soul, all kinds of things. I'm asking you, all of you, within your body, are you one person or two people? Please make up, make up your mind right now. One or two? Hello? That means you're healthy. If you are two, either you're uh, schizophrenic or you're possessed. You need either a psychiatrist or an exorcist <laughs> So, this self-respect -res business has to go because this will lead to all kinds of expectations. I respect myself, I think I'm a big guy, now I expect you also to treat me like that. When you don't, I will become resentful, angry, all kinds of things. There is no need for me to respect myself. But if I respect somebody, it may not even be because of their quality, it is because of my quality I respect somebody, isn't it? See, you looking up to something not necessarily mean that that person is in a fantastic place. It is just that you're in a place of learning, you're in a place of moving upward in your life. So you're looking up. You're looking up to something means you're moving upward. If you're looking down upon something means you're moving downward, isn't it? So, respect is between two people. I don't see how it is applicable. Within myself, I respect myself. I believe myself, I love myself. These are all statements of the insane. But unfortunately, it's spread across the world, it's becoming the fashion of the day. I'm sorry <laughs> I'll, I'll make it a little more focused towards the people out here. Uh, I, I completely understand what you're saying. But if somebody feels that he's putting in a lot of effort, and his efforts are not being recognized, how does that person motivate himself or herself to say, I don't really give a damn as to what other people think. I have to keep on doing what I'm doing. I have to excel myself every day. What is the message that you would like to give people who feel that sometimes uh, their efforts do not get recognized to the level that they think they have put in? See, these are two extremes. I don't give a damn, it's not going to work. 
especially if you're in the retail. <laughs> if you say, I don't give a damn, you're out of business. At the same time, thinking my efforts are not giving the necessary result. I think a whole lot of people feel this way. I'm saying in your assessment, you may be doing great, but the world has to recognize too. Somebody else has to see value to what you're doing, only then it'll find recognition. If you feel it's valuable, you're doing it, then don't bother about other people's recognition. But if what you're doing is useful to them, let's understand this, not because what you're doing is great, because what you're doing is useful to them, they will say, oh, this is wonderful. So, I don't give a damn definitely doesn't work. But whether other people recognize you or not, depending upon how useful it is at a given time to people, that depends what is the type of job you've taken up. Now, I must say this, shall I? See, uh, today wherever I go, people are saying things, oh, he's a yogi, he's a mystic. They don't know a damn thing about me being a yogi or a mystic, <laughs> okay? They don't know what is a yogi, what is a mystic. Now because it's internationally recognized, everybody's clapping their hands. <laughs> I've been saying the same things for the last thirty-five years. Nobody thought anything about it. Now somewhere else in America people are clapping their hands, here also they started clapping their hands, okay? It means nothing to me, all the recognition. Someday if people truly recognize what is being a yogi and are inspired to become that, that's wonderful. Of course, there are many people who are inspired by that. But today because it's internationally recognized, everybody is saying this is, he's a great yogi. They don't know what a damn, what is damn yogi is about. They don't know a damn thing about it. It is just that, Many people see it's useful to them, so there is recognition, let's understand this. People are not recognizing the quality of who I am, they're recognizing the usefulness that I am to them. Only that part gets recognition. The quality of what I am, only a handful of people will recognize that, rest will not even know what the hell it is <laughs> and it's okay <laughs> I, I think that's beautifully said and I think uh, if I was to translate that into our language out here in this room… Hey, don't I would use your language, huh? My language of the kind that I can use in front of you <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I, I would say that keep at it as to what you're doing, one day people will see the use of that in, your, in their lives and your time will come like his time came when people started clapping. So all you retail professionals, don't worry about what the world thinks, keep on doing what you're doing. Am I right in saying that? Oh, that <laughs> that's a deduction <laughs> I would say that if, you're, if your work is an expression of your joyfulness, whether recognition or no recognition, what does it matter? You're finding an opportunity to express your joy. And if you look at your own lives and see, the moments where, where you're in pursuit of your happiness, what is the quality of those moments? The moments when you're expressing your joy, what is the quality of those moments? If you see, you will see whenever you're expressing your happiness or joy, they are the best moments in your life. If your work is an expression of your joy, your working moments will be the best moments of your life. And the girls will come to you anyway. Anyway, as a customer at least she will come. Because… because ladies do most of the shopping, <laughs> they will anyway come. How you convert it is up to you <laughs> So the onus is on you guys. Um, but most of the salespersons are girls these days. I know, they, they, don't, they don't have any such problem <laughs> Okay, now a um, little difficult one. Um, For you or me? Nah, we'll figure that out. Um, for me, it's always difficult speaking to you, so I'm trying to make it slightly difficult for you. Now, this is about loyalties and beliefs. Uh, a lot of these people work in 
huge outlets. How, how do you handle loyalties and beliefs? A salesperson should have no loyalty to any product <laughs> He has no business, it's a customer's business to be loyal to a product. A salesperson, why should he be loyal to any product? He should sell whatever sells well, right? You're trying to… His job no, is no. to sell things that are not selling well. No, the question is, are you trying to uh, run a business or are you trying to propagate a philosophy? Most businesses today say that we don't sell a product, we sell philosophies <laughs> <laughs> Like certain soaps are not so supposed to be soaps, they are a self-expression of people. <laughs> I must tell you <laughs> When you're a salesperson, it is not for you to judge which customer is smart, which customer is stupid, okay? Only you can be smart or stupid. Customer has the right, it's his money, he can choose to buy whatever the hell he wants. It's not your business to judge, oh, this is a stupid customer, this is a smart customer, no. Your smart or stupid is the only question. Customer is the king because it's his money. He can buy whatever the hell he wants, it's nobody's business, it's his money. In today's day and scenario, uh, what is it that service, as you said earlier, it is what the other person thinks of you, not what you think of yourself. What is it that you would like to share with the people out here about the role of service and equate it to the meaning of service in our lives? About this service business, so we need to understand this. In our lives we do many things. When we do many things, we find in certain areas of life, the more opportunity we get to do something, more privileged we feel. In certain other places, we think if whatever little we do, we are doing too much. When we… when do we feel that we are doing too much for somebody? When we have no love for them of any kind, our heart is barren, then if I lift a pin for you, I feel I have done too much for you already. Because I have done great service for you, taking… picking this up and giving it to you. But if I have love for you, not as love for you or love for somebody else, simply that, see we need to understand this, certain pleasantness of your emotion is love. If you hold yourself in a certain pleasantness of emotion and you're loving, not just to this or that, you're just loving, then you will see you're willing to do as much as you can do. Of course, there are limits to our physical ability to do things, but whatever I can do, I will do. In anybody's life, this is all there is. In our lives, if we do not do what we cannot do, there is no problem. But in our lives, if we do not do what we can do, we are a disastrous life. So, first of all, bringing ourselves to a place within ourselves, that we ourselves will not be a restriction to our own ability to do things in the world. This is only possible when you have love for everything around you. Love is not about somebody, first of all. Love is the way you are, when you are loving, as you are happy, you can be loving. Pleasantness of the mind may be called joy, pleasantness of the heart may be called love. So if you are loving, then doing whatever you can do in a given moment is natural. If you do do that, will the customer stay with you? Of course. But this is not a trick. <laughs> I was… Uh, we were conducting a program for the top twenty-five executives of Microsoft. There were twenty-five of them, two-day event, and I have nine volunteers. Our volunteers are always on their toes doing everything possible that they can do. Uh, and uh, these people just look at them and say, Sadhguru, where do you get such people? You know, they are always looking for attrition <laughs> I say, no, you don't get such people, you got to make them. How do we make them? I said, you have to make them fall in love with you. How do we make them fall in love with us? I said, first you have to fall in love with them. They said, oh, they don't pay us for that. 
<laughs> so in this context if you work, now work will be a pain. On the surface, something else, your remunerations or recognitions may keep you going, but it will suck the life out of you. But if your work is, is an expression of who you are, if your work is an expression of your joy and your love in your life, you don't have to worry about service. Service exists only where the heart is barren. If your heart is full for everything that comes in front of you, you will do your best. When you do your best, things will happen, both for him and for you. Above all, your life will get enriched with work. Activity will enrich you, activity will not drain you. All of us in Isha Foundation, <laughs> I've all driven them, I've driven all of them into this kind of madness. Every day is twenty hours a day, seven days of the week, three hundred and sixty-five days. Today, a few thousand people have gotten into this state, all of them are on seven days of the week. People think these people are, what are they, possessed with something, but joyfully they'll go around and do. See, it's not even twenty-four hours since I landed from United States. Already I've finished two events and come <laughs> and I'm traveling to Delhi today evening. So people ask, are you trying to kill yourself? Anyway, you're going to die. Are you going to die of exhaustion or boredom? I don't want to die of boredom for sure, that's decided. I may die of exhaustion, but that's okay. At least you're doing what you really care to do. In your life, if you're constantly creating what you care to create, then you find you don't have to do any service. If I ask all of you, doesn't matter retail or wholesale you are, <laughs> for yourself and for everybody around you, what is it that you want to create? To create a peaceful you, a joyful you, a loving you is what you're looking for, isn't it? You're trying to achieve it in so many different ways. Pleasantness within yourself, is it not very important? Hello? You want to be a pleasant life. What is it that you want from your life? You want your experience of life to be as pleasant as possible. You may call it peace, you may call it joy, you may call it pleasure, you may call it health, you may call it love, you may call it ecstasy. It doesn't matter what you call it, essentially different levels of pleasantness. If you try to create outside pleasantness, that's called success, if you succeed in having that. Otherwise, pleasantness in your experience of life. If you are… if you create this for yourself, that if you sit here, you are hundred percent pleasant within you. When you are feeling wonderful, if I meet you, any one of you, I'm sure you are a wonderful human being. But when you are feeling nasty, when you're feeling miserable, when you're feeling frustrated, if I meet you, you could be a nasty human being, yes or no? Is this not true for every human being? So instead of doing service and sacrifice and all kinds of terrible things in this life, if you keep this… this piece of life in a very pleasant condition, you will always be pleasant to everything and everybody around you. There is no effort in this. The only effort you have to do is to figure out within this how to keep this pleasant little sadhana, to keep this one pleasant. If you keep this pleasant, every act, every thought, every emotion that you generate will naturally be pleasant, yes or no? Yes or no? Yes. If I meet you when you're very happy, are you not a wonderful, wonderful human being? Almost twenty-four percent of our time, resource and energy has been spent in the prisons, both in India and outside. If you look at this, uh, the history sheets of these people, normally we're working with long-term prisoners, they've done terrible things in their life. I know them very well now. If you let all of them out tomorrow morning, at least fifty percent of the people will do the same things again. They're not by intention, many of them, by compulsion, they'll do the same things. But when they are with me, they are most wonderful people, okay? They are very exuberant, joyful, highly spirited, wonderful guys <laughs> because I just keep them happy when they are with me. 
This is true with every human being. Unfortunately, in this world, we've always been trying to produce good people, which is a serious mistake. Good people have done terrible things on this planet. The more good they think they are, more terrible things they've done to other people. But a joyful person very rarely does anything harmful to somebody else, because it doesn't occur to him. He's not trying to be good, he's just feeling wonderful. Naturally, he will do wonderful things to people. We have to invest in producing joyful and sensible human beings on the planet, not good people, because the more good they are, the more they are in conflict with everything else. Please see where is the conflict. The more good you think you are, the more fighting you are. We don't need good people, we can send them to heaven. But on this planet, we need joyful people, we need sensible people <laughs> that's, that's really wonderful. I, I think um, I would have asked you the last question for me about leadership, but I think that you answered a lot of things. If people read between the lines, you've answered a lot of questions about leadership anyway. But um, if you would uh, like, how do you inspire your people because they are the leaders of tomorrow? The more they're already my leaders. <laughs> the more we have, the better off we'll be. Uh, any tips that you would like to share with the people <laughs> out here as to how, how a team is made from beyond being a great individual player? Even a Brian Lara couldn't win for West Indies. You need uh, 11 good people to win a match. So anything that you would like to share? India, in my perception, is a, a tremendous talent pool. This is not… I'm not speaking this out of uh, my nationalistic uh, fervor. <laughs> I'm not so identified with the political identity of a nation as such. But what I see is, uh, having spoken to all kinds of people across the world. You know, I've spoken in large universities, scientific community which have very keen minds, academics and others, but on an average, if you pick up a bunch of uh, hundred people off the streets of Mumbai or Bangalore or Chennai or somewhere, you will find generally they are of a higher intellect than what you can pick up anywhere in the world, believe me. I'm not saying this because I'm an Indian. Generally, natural intellect is very high, but it is one of the most disorganized intellects. They have intelligence, but organization has not happened, which essentially means lack of leadership. There has not been uh, an inspiring leadership for a long time. We get leaders only when there is super crisis. We don't get leaders to manage our well-being and enhance our well-being. Only when we're in a real deep pit, like Mahatma Gandhi is born, uh, because we're in a total mess. Somebody else has occupied us and everything bad has been done to us. Now one leader props up out of desperation, otherwise, to be a leader, naturally to stand up and be a leader, to create good things, to maintain good things and to enhance good things in the world. We… I, when I look back, I have not seen a leader like that for a long time in the history of this country. I think this is mainly… has many things to… many… there are many factors to this. I think one main factor is we have been an occupied nation for too long and somehow we have developed this attitude, don't put your head up, somehow put it down and go home. Don't confront problems, avoid problems, has been our attitude always. <coughs> I think even today mothers are teaching their children, if there's any problem on the street, just put your head down and come home. Don't try to fix it, that's not your problem. Essentially a leader means in some way you're willing to confront problems. You're willing, willing to seek out problems and possible problems and fix them before they happen. But that attitude has not been there, so we've not built leadership. And also being an occupied nation, we did not build many layers of leadership. If a good leader comes up there, everybody will start worshipping him. A leader does not need worship. 
he needs many tiers of leadership for him to find traction and do something meaningful. If his leadership has to find expression in the world or in a nation or in a state or in an industry or whatever, you need many tiers of leadership. But in our society, generally when a good leader comes up, we will see worship, somebody will start building temples for him, somebody will start doing puja for him, all these things start happening. We have to shift from this attitude. Looking up to a leader for inspiration is good. But losing all sense about him is not good. So what is needed in this country is to develop those diff many tiers of leadership. This is in uh, somewhere in 2004 that uh, someone was at our yoga center, a very prominent person in the country, and he asked me, Sadhguru, this is great what you're doing, but what about the nation? I said, see, I have a list of two thousand people who will make a difference for this country if we impact them. Get me these two thousand people in the next four years. You will see a quiet change will happen in the nation. I'm not talking about prime ministers, chief ministers, because generally their tenure is five years and they're gone. But there's another set of leaders in the society who may be business leaders, who may be bureaucratic leaders and social leaders of various kinds, who have a solid twenty-five to thirty years to impact. Because if you're thinking of any kind of serious impact, uh, you have to think at least twenty-five years at a time. Otherwise nothing significant can be done. So we've been trying to reach them and touch them. Now I can say about forty-two percent of these two thousand people across the country we have touched, they are bringing about a quiet, silent revolution. <coughs> because in my perception, a revolution is not about, I want you to change, this is not a revolution, this is a problem, this is the basis of all problems, I want you to change. I am willing to change, this is a revolution. To bring this forth in everybody, whatever is needed for the situation, I am willing to change myself and do my best in this given situation. This is a revolution, this is the revolution we need in this country right now. Because everybody is stuck to their own mindsets, their own caste, their own creeds, their own whatever, different kinds of things. Everybody is an activist for his own causes. There is no bloody cause which is good enough in this world except human well-being. There is no other cause which is worthy of human attention. If we don't dedicate ourselves to that, if we dedicate ourselves to that, everyone in some way will become a leader. If your fundamental thing when you step out of your home, if your thing is today wherever possible, whichever way possible, I will impact as many people as possible. What I'm saying is, let's say you come in touch with ten people. If ten people come your way today, you can either impact them positively or negatively or you can let it pass by. Whatever the nature of your job, whether you are just a salesperson, sales manager, manager, whatever you are up there, even if you're a beggar on the street, you know, beggar has the maximum number of clients per day <laughs> It doesn't matter who you are. I have seen beggars who are positively impacting anybody who comes to them, they're saying the right things. I'm saying in every possible way, either you can positively impact somebody, negatively impact somebody or let it pass. So according to one's capacity to do things, depending upon one's intelligence, competence, capability and the position that we hold at a given moment, our impact may be small or big, but we can impact. If we exercise this right, if we exercise this choice every moment of our life, wherever you are, you always impact whoever comes in touch with you, you will positively impact them in whatever way possible. You are a leader, how far you will go? Let us see the competence and then, you know, suppose uh, you are an IT engineer, you have information technology ideas thousand years ago, all right? Maybe you would remain unemployed right through your life, but you could still impact people. I'm saying the time also decides how impactful we are at a given time in history. 
But the important thing is that you take up this responsibility. Whoever comes in front of you, you will in somehow make a positive impact on their life. If you start doing this, you are a leader. Whether what capacity you function in depends on variety of things that will anyway arrange itself over a period of time. Thank you. Pranam Sadhguru, you've been saying this for a while and I've been listening to you for a long time. The eye is more powerful than the iPhone, yeah? And the iPhone in the box comes with the user's Now menu. that depends whether you are using the iPhone or iPhone is using you up. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Depending on that. <laughs> And you've also said a lot of times that you've not read the user's He's manual. So where is the human being's user manual? Because the iPhone comes with the user manual in the book, in the box. And how do you find our, my user manual or the human being's user manual? <laughs> so uh, please don't uh, go and browse through the bookstores. It's not there <laughs> See, when you say me or I, you may have many ideas about what is me. But essentially, whatever ideas and ideologies you might have developed around you, essentially you are a piece of life, yes? Yes or no? None of you saying anything? Are you life or are you something? Now I am having doubts. Are you life? Hey, show me that you're life. Not like that? Make some lively sounds. Okay, okay. Oh, that's life. So you are life. You may be identified with many things, starting from your body. Because you identified your body, your agenda, because you're identified with your education, you become something else. You identify with your religion, you become something else. Like this you go on multiplying your identities many different ways. That may be a social requirement. To function in the society, you take on something, that's fine. But fundamentally your life, if you want to know life, if you think the user's manual is some scripture that you have, somebody has written, it can't be. Because what you're seeking to know is the nature of this one. Because your life, you don't have to read another one, you have to pay attention to this one. Now you pay attention to everything else, but not enough to this one. When I say paying attention to this one, this is not about standing in front of the mirror and paying attention to this. Really paying attention to something fundamentally this, because even your body you acquired from outside, isn't it? Hmm? It's the food that you've eaten. What you call as my mind, the content of your body and the content of your mind. This is the food that you've eaten, this is the impressions that you've taken in. But more fundamental than that, you still exist. So, if what you, what you want to know is life and you are life, all you have to do is delve deeper into your experience. And the user's manual is right there. And life is not something that you use. Life is something that you allow it to blossom and flourish. You don't have to use this life, there's nothing like that. You just have to allow it to blossom to its fullest possibility. If it blossoms, <coughs> then it will do the best possible things. See, every life on this planet, whether it is a worm or an insect or a bird or a tree, every one of them is trying to become a full-fledged life, isn't it? A mango tree is not trying to become a coconut tree. I'm sorry to mention mangoes a little early in the season, hmm? But a mango tree is aspiring to become a full-fledged mango tree. But we know what is a full-fledged earthworm, we know what is a full-fledged grasshopper, we know what is a full-fledged tree, but we do not know what is a full-fledged human being. Because whatever you become in your life, you will notice 
that you would want to be something more. If that something more happens, you want to be something more. If that something happens, you want to be something more, yes or no? Wherever you are right now in your life, you still want to be something more. If you really look at this, you will see what you want is a limitless expansion. You are not looking for this much or that much, you are looking for an infinite expansion. If you are looking for an infinite expansion, how do you get there? You are looking for infinite expansion through physical means. This is never going to be fulfilled because physical means it has a defined boundary. The fundamentals of physicality is it must have a defined boundary. If there is no boundary, you cannot call it physical anymore. Right now, there is something within you longing for an infinite expansion, but you're trying to give it physical means. How you're longing to find expansion is finding expression is. If it finds a very basic physical expression, we call this sexuality. Something that is not you, you want to make that a part of yourself, that's the effort. If it finds an emotional expression, we will call that love, because something that is not you, you're trying to wrap it with your emotions and make it a part of yourself. If it finds a mental expression, it gets labeled as greed, ambition, conquest or uh, simply shopping. Of course, you're not against that. <laughs> All these are the same effort that a human being is trying to be something more than what they are right now. But all of you have lived long enough to know, more is not going to settle you, you want all of it. Even if I make you the king or queen of this planet, still you will look at the remaining galaxies, yes or no? Because that's the nature of the human being. This will not settle for this much and that much. If you want, you can go in installments, but approaching the infinite through installments, I think is a stupid way to go. Because you can't count one, two, three, four, five and say one day infinite, you can only become endless counting. So the manual is right here, don't believe me, don't believe anything that anybody says, but pay attention to the life that you are. Not your thought, not your emotion, not your physical structure, but the fundamental life that you are, if you pay enough attention to that, Everything you want to know about life is right here. You don't have to listen to anybody's discourses, you don't have to read anybody's scriptures, you don't have to listen to anybody's teachings, because what you know about… what you need to know about life is yours fundamentally, because you are life. If you are not life, then you will have to do graduation about life, then you have to do masters about life, then you have to do research about life, but you are life. Are you… you're not accepting this, are you? Are you hundred percent life? If you are life, no study needed about it. You just have to… you're too identified with other things, accessories of life. You are so identified with accessories of life, what you are has not come into your perspective. You carry the accessories to the ex extent you want to the extent you need. Anything more if you carry, your life will become distorted and ugly. But fundamentally your life, what is the quality of this life? Have you allowed it to blossom or have you kept it constipated? That's a question. If it blossoms, it… it reads it to you. Pranam Sadhguru, here. Oh, okay. Uh, Sir, I listened to what you just said, uh, that you are life and the manual is inside you. No, 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 don't listen to me, I'm asking you, are you life? Absolutely and I… I understand that you, and No, I no, are you agreeing with… are you agreeing with me or are you really life? I am life. Okay, then fine. Because I don't… I'm not used to talking to dead people, you see <laughs> <laughs> The question here is… Uh, to get to the ultimate goal, uh, the importance of a guru uh, in the real sense of the word, is that absolutely critical or can you find it on your own? To… Uh, 
if you want to walk an uncharted terrain, a terrain that you're not familiar with, it's… it's good to take the help of a person who's already walked the terrain. It's just sensible, that's all. Every year we trek in the Himalayas. I've been trekking for over thirty-five, almost forty years I've been trekking in the Himalayas. Now for eleven, twelve years I've been trekking in Tibet. But when I'm in the mountains, this illiterate mountain guy on Sherpa or somebody, he simply says like this, go like that. In my mind I think maybe this is better, but he says this, I go that way, he says that, I go that way. It's because it's just sensible. Sometimes I may know little better than him on a few things, but still it's better to follow him there because one mistake if you make, it'll take days to correct that mistake and it's very expensive. Sometimes it could be life. <laughs> so when you're walking an uncharted terrain, a terrain that you're not familiar with, it is sensible to take guidance. This thing about, do I need a guru, can't I do it myself? Of course you can do it by yourself. It is just that, to find something that is next door, you may go around the world and come back. This happened. Someone came looking for Isha Yoga Center near Coimbatore. They came to a local village and they asked one village boy there, how far is Isha Yoga Center? The boy said, well, it's uh, twenty-four thousand nine hundred and ninety-six miles. They said, what, that's far? He said, yeah, the way you're going, if you turn around, it's four miles. So, you may be very qualified with something else. When it comes to a certain aspect of life, you talk to people who have walked the terrain before you, that's all it is. Because it's a completely uncharted terrain, largely because it's an inward terrain, you seek help, otherwise what is right here you may take a lifetime. The intent is that you find it today or as quickly as possible, and enjoy the fruit of that for the rest of your life. But most people think uh, <laughs> their spiritual seeking should happen at the end of their life. That's unfortunate. Knowing this piece of life in its entirety, should it happen at the beginning of your life or the end of your life? Hmm? Life should begin with spiritual process. Do not think spiritual process means looking up, looking down, going to the temple. No, this is not what it is, it's about turning inward. This is about knowing this piece of life absolutely. Even you… Uh, I mean he was talking about the phone, even if you have to use a simple gadget like a phone, the more you know about it, the better you can use it, is it so? Is it so? Why is that not true with this? This is all self-realization means, let me put… make it very simple. If you know everything that you need to know about this, that means you're self-realized. You know it in only parts, so you use it only in parts. If you know everything about this, you can use it in a phenomenal way. In a truly phenomenal way, you can use this. And this should happen at the earliest possible time in your life, not on your deathbed. Right, we call it a day, Sadhguru, as always, thank you so much sir, from… on behalf of all of us here and Pranam. <laughs>